women normally get to work seasonal time only and when the season is done there's no jobs for women ese niño con discapacidad eh, muchas veces no se sabe su origen eh, no se sabe su realidad y por ende no no se piensa un, una planificación de decir qué hacemos con estas personas eh, cómo logramos o permitimos que eh, se puedan desarrollar o evolucionar uh, we are facing a lot of challenges when it comes to sanitation we usually find a, a challenge with, when draining the toilets just to get them to drain the toilets some of them are full some of them are damaged some of them are not being serviced at all eh, entonces como si fuera que ellos no son seres humanos que merece estudiar, que merece un espacio más digno, que merece un, eh, un título universitario, que, que, que merece un, un, algo hermoso que pueda suceder, o ser empresario o lo que sea. trabajado en ocho aspectos de la Agenda de Desarrollo 2030 y siempre con un enfoque vinculado a la interculturalidad con los pueblos indígenas del Paraguay, el enfoque de garantía de derechos humanos y un enfoque también de diversidad cultural y de igualdad de género en, en el país. As Vikelan has started as a way of continuing with monitoring what was happening on the ground, but also making sure that the voices of um, the communities is heard in terms of where they are at, what they need, and how much they need. punto clave de la cooperación de la Unión Europea es seguir trabajando y apostar por lo que es el desarrollo de capacidades y dejar capacidad instalada desde lo que es el Estado para seguir fortaleciendo la institucionalidad del Estado. Clientele that we uh, receive at the center it's women who come from um, a, they are not uh, economically independent. So um, we try to empower them economically so that when they go out, they can be able to sustain themselves. Esa experiencia ha sido bastante importante porque nos permite eh, realizar nuestro trabajo misional y los objetivos que tenemos como institución que tiene que ver con la incidencia en políticas públicas, en marcos legales y en presupuesto para justamente poder reducir las desigualdades y que el Estado sea efectivamente un garante de derechos. The sector, I think, really, it needs a lot more. And it's not just about resources, but I think commitment from whoever has to play a part. Just wish they could also include us uh, so that we can be more participative in their processes of decision making. Creo que, eh, independientemente de la condición física que yo tengo hoy en día, eh, tengo el mismo derecho de poder eh, Vivir la vida. Good morning, everybody, and thank you all very, very much for uh, being here. I'm Tanya, Tanya Cox, the Director of Concord, and it's really a great pleasure to welcome you all here. 
The video that you've just seen is um, the result of a piece of work that we've been doing over the last few months where we went to Paraguay, to Bangladesh and to South Africa with the help of a consultant as well. And we got stories from lots of people and we've been able to bring them to you today and we're going to be talking about them more as we go through the day. Um, but you can see this has also turned into a report which we've got here and which you can actually download. I think my comms colleagues have been super clever and put a QR on the television outside so that you can actually, I think, with your cameras, download it. It's beyond me, but I'm sure they've made it happen. <laughs> um, so it is my great pleasure, right at the front of today, to welcome Commissioner Jutta Urpelainen. Commissioner, would you like to come up to the stage? Commissioner Urpelainen, uh, thank you so much for being with us today and for kick-starting our Equality Day for us, but also a year in which a lot of things are happening on inequalities and tackling inequalities. And the Commissioner has been an ally of civil society and of Concord in particular right since the beginning, since 2019, so thank you again also for that. And the Commissioner, as we all know, is a keen supporter to tackle inequalities to see what we can all do together to make sure we stop this scourge. So the Commissioner has accepted to give our very first keynote speech of the day. Thank you, Commissioner. Over to you. Thank you very much, Tanya. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yes, I like this energy. So uh, I have to say that it is a great honor for me to, to welcome you all to Concord's first ever, if I understood correctly, first ever Equality Day. And you know that I'm also a former uh, civil society activist myself, so when I always come to these kind of meetings, I feel like home. So it's great to be here with you today. Um, Tania, as you said in your introduction, the fight against inequalities is a top priority of my mandate as a commissioner. It was the reason why I became a politician. I wanted to fight inequalities. No one, no one chooses where they are born or under what circumstances. So I really think, as policymakers, we have an obligation to fight for a world that really gives everyone, everyone, the opportunity to thrive. And the Sustainable Development Goals and uh, Agenda lays out the path to that world and the European Union is fully committed to putting the SDGs back on track. And of course, civil society is one of our key partner in this objective. I would have three messages today. And my first message is, as inequalities are a multi-dimensional issue, the European Union is responding on multiple fronts, from fair economy to investing in people and planet, and promoting inclusive and participatory democracy. For example, we are working with partner countries to fight tax evasion and also corruption. Because we know that fiscal reform is very crucial in the fight against inequalities. When everyone pays their fair share, there are more opportunities for education, well-functioning public health systems, but also stronger social protection. The EU is also investing in shock-resilient social protection systems, human development and education. To just give you one example, we have an important Team Europe initiative in Bangladesh. So we bring social protection up to minimum international standards, improve demand-driven skills training, and uh, enhance access to quality education. The EU has launched cross-cutting programs to support marginalized groups. And for instance, through our Gender Action Plan 3, which you know, of course, very well, and you have been uh, contributed to that, we work to ensure that women and girls can exercise full, equal, and meaningful participation, both in public and private life. And we have a target 
by 2021, 85% of new EU actions will contribute to gender equality alongside other priority areas. Similarly, the first ever Youth Action Plan, which you also know very well, uh, in external action, engages, empowers, and connects youth around the world. And we need definitely youth to shape a fair, more sustainable future. And you know that as a commissioner, I have invested heavily uh, in young people and, and youth, and, and still we have a lot to do. My second message is that the EU Global Gateway Strategy contributes directly to the implementation of all SDGs. You know that Global Gateway Strategy is our 300 billion euros offer to connect the world in a more sustainable and rule, rules-based manner and way. Global Gateway is about investment in sustainable connectivity in key areas like energy, digital, transport and climate, but not only hard connectivity. It is also about strengthening the broader enabling environment like health, education, skills and resilience. And as Team Europe, we combine the resources of the European Union, member states, their development finance institutions and the private sector. And of course, of course, you play a key role. CSOs are crucial partners in the rollout of the Global Gateway, in particular at the country level. We have regular consultations with CSOs on the design, but also on the implementation of the Team Europe initiatives and EU-funded projects contributing to Global Gateway. You know that many of our Team Europe initiatives are at the same time also Global Gateway flagships. But in addition to that, we will also establish a global gateway civil society dialogue platform within the existing policy forum for, de for development. I believe that this new forum actually and platform gives us more an opportunity to have a frank and open dialogue and also learn and exchange views and, and learn from, from each other. As Team Europe, we can have the necessary impact to fight systemic inequality. And my last message actually is that the EU is actively monitoring our inequality work, inequalities work to ensure that we are making progress. And this is important for me, actually it has been since I started as a commissioner, to really see the impact of our work. You know that I'm a former national politician myself, and uh, uh, for me, the connection with voters has always been very important. I need to be able to listen to my voters, but also to be able to explain to them why we have taken certain decisions in order to earn the legitimacy for, for the activities and decisions we have, we have taken. And I think also from that perspective, to really to be able to monitor the results and the impact of our decisions and activities is so important. So, um, in the preparation for the SDG summit, the EU will conduct the first comprehensive voluntary review of our internal and external SDG implementation efforts. And this voluntary review will help us really identify progress made so far, as well as areas for improvement. And I really look forward to preparing this presentation in July in New York with you. And I'm also very proud to announce that the EU will launch in the next weeks, in April, a new inequality marker. And I'm very proud of this marker, because this marker will capture inequalities in a multi-dimensional manner, and it really helps us better understand, track and benchmark the impact of our work. We can really see that, okay, what is our impact 
to inequalities through different actions and, and decisions. So dear friends, dear colleagues, recent events definitely have displayed global inequalities from the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine to COVID-19 crisis. But even before these uh, and those shocks, the world was, of course, and this is important to remember. So I think it's time to put it back on track. And we have now a window of opportunity with the upcoming SDG summit. So let's not miss this opportunity of accelerating SDG progress globally. And to be very honest, we definitely need you. We need social, uh, civil society organizations and community to put political pressure so that we could able to achieve in the autumn, in that summit, SDG summit, recommitment, re-political commitment to SDGs. I'm doing my part, you can count on the EU, but we need you. So let's work together. I know there's no need to convince you, anyone in this room, of the importance of tackling inequalities. You wouldn't be here otherwise. And we've all probably had our own personal experience where we've bumped up against inequalities and said, this just isn't right. Mine goes back a long way. When I was actually working in the private sector, I visited a friend who uh, was working for an NGO in Cambodia. and. They, the, the business of this NGO was to take young children off a rubbish dump where they were scummaging around for cans and bottles and, and all sorts to resell. And this NGO was trying to get them into an education. So going back to what Jutta was saying about the importance of education and starting young. We obviously went to see the rubbish dump where the children were coming from and where they were working. And I have to admit, I'm ashamed actually to have to admit, that I had never had an experience like this before of seeing such poverty and such inequality. These children were as young as four, five, six, and they were in bare feet, rummaging around up to knee high in this broken glass and bottles and cans and all sorts of things. And I was like, oh my goodness, I had never realized it was possible for a child literally to have no hope. Of course, they didn't see it like that, because this was coming from my perspective. This was my interpretation of the situation. But I'm really glad that now, many years on, there is a lot more consensus around the importance of tackling situations like that, inequalities, on a global scale. We've got the World Bank making statements. We have the IMF making statements. We have the G20, the G7, and of course, we have the EU making extremely important commitments to tackling inequalities. So, what's the issue then if we're all in agreement? It's that we need to turn the words into action. And I couldn't agree with Jutta more when she's giving us a sense of urgency. We need to turn this into much more action now. We need to accelerate the action, to use Jutta's words. So today, what we want to do is to share with you this sense of urgency. The world is facing two major urgencies, and we've got to deal with them. The climate crisis and the inequalities crisis. And quite a lot of attention is, rightly so, being given to the climate crisis. But in our opinion, not enough attention is being given to the inequalities crisis. This may be because people have a tendency to think it's happening to other people. But in actual fact, it concerns all of us. In a globalized world, we're only as strong as the weakest link. So the weakest link matters. And we were reminded of this during the COVID pandemic. We were reminded extremely clearly of this. So we mustn't forget that lesson. Our globalized world is one where 
the systematic linkages between everything and everyone are really reinforced. Many issues we see, whether it's migration or social unrest or climate change, they have their roots in and or are, you know, causes of inequalities. That's why in Concord, we've made the fight against inequalities the red thread throughout all our work for many years now. And we've just reconfirmed this and made it even more explicit in our four-year strategy that members adopted last year. When we're thinking about inequalities, I'd like us to take a, the starting point that inequalities are not accidents of fate. They're the result of deliberate choices that have been made by people in positions of power. <coughs> the soaring inequality that we see today is a direct result of policymakers and leaders' decisions that have been made in the past, their decisions and their actions, or non-actions. But that means that these policies and these actions can be changed. And it means that the results can be reversed, which gives us reason for hope. And it's in this spirit of hope that we have crafted the Equality Day, in a spirit of hope and in the belief that we can all together tackle inequalities and make a difference. But it depends on political will. Because as they say, where there's a will, there's a way. And so I was extremely happy to hear the commissioner earlier on say, she has the will. She will be leading DG INPA to make the difference. We need then to step up to the plate as well. Because the solutions, which we're going to be thinking about all of us today as well, aren't actually that easy. It's going to involve challenging power, challenging privilege, the patriarchal system, and our current economic model. As a contribution to show what is possible, we did this research that you saw a little bit earlier of a little bit earlier on in the video in Paraguay, Bangladesh, South Africa. We looked at what the EU is already doing, which is making a difference. And we were lucky enough to speak to some of the people in the local communities, and they shared their stories with us. They shared their experiences. And they're contained in this report that I've been waving around, and which I hope you'll download. Our partners were really clear. The EU has a really important role to play. And often the EU's putting things on the table that their governments are unwilling to deal with. But they're also worried. Because they're a country may be appearing to do quite well, if you look at it, for example, from GDP figure terms, they're worried then that the EU may start withdrawing. However, these, GD, these rosy, potentially rosy GDP figures actually mask a whole host of inequalities which still exist, even if income inequality might be falling. Things like violence, discrimination, lack of access to basic services, these remain really huge problems. And that means then that a sense of well-being is still actually quite, quite far off. It's a dream for many, many people around the world. And that again goes to show that GDP and well-being don't go hand in hand. So we really need to be measuring well-being if that's what we want to improve. Our partners shared with us ideas of what more the EU and we could be doing based on their experiences. They told us that a multidimensional and intersectional approach is absolutely critical to making change. It's not an option. They told us that it's crucial that inequalities is a specific priority, not an afterthought and not only mainstreamed. And that's why, actually, in part, we want to focus on the Global Gateway this afternoon in one of our breakout groups, because addressing inequalities is a, or should be a criterion for every funding decision that the EU makes. And if the Global Gateway is going to have the results that the EU is hoping, 
then it needs to be a gateway to equality. The, community, the, the people we were talking to also shared with us that it's really important to engage with communities, to really understand their experiences of inequalities. The way inequalities are actually lived is different to how we might perceive it from the outside. I talked earlier on about my perception of things. It's not theirs. Their lived experience is super important. And it varies between regions and countries and within countries and even by community. So consultation and dialogue are absolutely key if we want to have impact and we want to make change. And lastly, they told us that we need to focus on long-term change. They understand that systemic change takes time. So investing in the sustainability of the projects is extremely important. But I'd like to go a little bit further than that. Sometimes policymakers think, or it seems at least to me, that they're thinking that they're taking a long-term perspective in the proposals that they're making. But in actual fact, they're reacting, again, it seems to me, to the uncertainty, the insecurity that's surrounding us, especially these days. Now, we know that uncertainty breeds short-termism. So we need to be really careful that we don't fall into that trap. We've got to do things differently now. We've got to use, we've got to use the opportunities that we're facing, that we have in front of us, and that the commissioner was referring to earlier on, to actually make this difference especially if we're going to actually solve a massive systemic problem like, systemic, as like inequalities. But it means then that all our actions have to be focused on the well-being of both current and future generations. And it means that we're going to need to make sure that our policies and our actions don't inadvertently, or sometimes knowingly, actually impact ne negatively on other people even if those other people may be across the other side of the world, and we can't see them, we don't know them. That's why in our second breakout group this afternoon, we're going to be addressing the issue of policy coherence. The EU has to stop giving with one hand and taking with the other. We've got seven years left to reach the SDGs. And as far as inequalities goes, we've got even further because of all the recent crises which have been taking us backwards. So let's pull out all the stops together to stop the scourge of inequalities. Let's be creative in our thinking. Let's be courageous in our actions. Let's make sure we contribute to achieving an equal, fair, inclusive societies in a sustainable world. Thank you, and I wish you all a very inspiring day. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce a friend, Darmendra Ganani, who works with Friends of Europe as their chief spokesman, but who has very kindly agreed to take on the role of moderator for the day. Darmendra, I'll let you introduce yourself, and then you can uh, maybe introduce the video and take us through the rest of the day. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you so much for agreeing to be with us. Thank you for your fantastic speech. <laughs> I don't, am I on here or do I have, you can, I'm great, excellent. Firstly, thank you very much. Firstly, Tanya uh, uh, and Borja and others, thank you so much for asking me to uh, moderate this uh, first ever Equalities Day that you've organized. Um, I've been in Brussels for about six, seven years and my formative years, uh, this kind of, a, a, you know, me telling you a little bit about me, I grew up professionally both in Scotland and London working in the racial equality and equalities field. So all of my kind of formative period was about tackling um, discrimination and harassment, taking cases out on behalf of people and trying to promote equality both at a regional and then national level. Then I became head of the Commission for Racial Equality in the UK. So I went from the voluntary sector into the public sector. So this is kind of, um, it's an interesting comeback. Thank you for providing the opportunity because I've, I've formally left that area of work for some time. 
But what I'm struck by uh, in, in the dialogue that we've heard, and I'd, I'd be interested to hear from those of you who are, uh, let's say, nearer my age rather than the age of those of you who are somewhere at the back who look in your millennial zone, um, <laughs> is whether you feel as if the rhetoric and the narrative has changed. And, you know, I don't want to be not hopeful, um, but I feel that we are endlessly repeating the same arguments around equality and inequality. Um, and we're kind of, I suppose, let me cut to the chase. When I was thinking about coming, um, uh, coming here today, I felt that um, I, we, of my generation or our generation, we need to stop asking, demanding, and creating a business case for equality. We need to change the narrative and turn it on its head and have an expectation and create a norm that this is what normative policy making is about. And that equality, inclusion, and fairness and justice has to be a given, an expectation, a professional competence, and a societal outcome you, we expect, we require. And I think if we change that mindset, we move the distance and the dial on the dialogue we have around equalities and inequalities. That's just my view. Uh, but I feel that we, uh, we need to change that. We need to kind of upend our mindset and go from making a business case through to making a, this a requirement, and as I say, a societal outcome that we expect this to happen. And once we have that mindset, a number of things actually happen, but we'll go in the dialogue about that um, later on this afternoon. Um, Tanya's already explained to you what we're going to be doing uh, during the day, so there's a big focus on being able to uh, look at the state of play, uh, where we are, where Europe is in relation to its, let's we call it, international development criteria, you know, uh, credentials, uh, but then looking separately at coherence and whether, as you say, Tanya, you take with one hand, you give with the other, or, or the other way round. How do you make sure it works? And then will be an opportunity to have two panel conversations, which I'm going to have a great pleasure. You've got, um, for those of you who don't know, I mean, we've got a you know stunning array of characters from all over the world who are going to contribute to this conversation. And I suppose at the end of the day, what, we're, what are we looking for? I hope that by the conclusion of today, uh, and what, there's one of it was yourself who asked me, what do you want out of this uh, at the end of the day? And I said, I hope we come out of here not feeling like we've had a good old chat, we've all agreed on the problems, we agree who the culprits are, and then we wash it all over again. I hope that's not what we end up. I hope where we end up is to think about next year is a significant election in Europe, the European parliamentary elections. Um, nearly 20% of the population in Europe are first-time voters and young people. So for the first time, you're going to have an opportunity to that actually younger generations may tilt the balance and the colour and the political opportunity of Europe in the future. And also, it's the, uh, I suppose, the advent of a new commission mandate. So Jutta uh, has done a fabulous job. Uh, I've had many, many discussions moderating with her on issues around talking differently, especially about Africa, and thinking about a very different kind of dialogue. Uh, and she's demonstrated a commitment in that respect, I have to say. But uh, given what I said about how, how you treat this agenda, what should we be asking of the new commission mandate? What do you want as NGOs and those working in the field? What should the parliament prioritize? What should the policy book that the new mandate's going to contain for 2024 onwards, what should it have as priorities? What do you think it should be in there? And therefore then Concord, I think, will have a manifesto for change, which it can then socialize with political parties and take forward. So I'm hoping, we haven't discussed this, Tanya, this is just my view. I just think, um, I hope you agree, um, that, um, that you know, that'll make a change, that we come up with, even if it's five ideas, Let's come up with some things that you and we can then go out and say, actually, this is what we need. And, you know, from Friends of Europe, one of the things that we're working on is a renewed social contract. Uh, we're working on creating 10 policy choices for the new mandate um, here in Europe. And I hope that one of them will be about how we tackle inequalities in Europe, working with the civil society sector. But also, I think, again, it isn't our or your burden. This is the other dynamic that frustrates me. It's, and I, I agree with uh, uh, what you just said about, you know, I need you to be out there and forceful. But so do you need the private sector. You need women entrepreneurs. You need the tech entrepreneurs. We need the financial gurus on the same page. It can't just be a civil society agenda to change 
and turn the dial on inequalities. It has to be that multi-sectoral approach. Without that, we'll still be in this room, those of us chess beating, that in 10 years' time think, oh, the world hasn't changed. So let's change some of that through our own mindset, our own perspective, and our own approach to the agenda. So that's enough from me. I'm going to now introduce, um, we have a... A video, absolutely. Uh, thank you for keeping me right. So, um, no, it's great, it's great. Because I did that crappy thing of what I did was I kind of sat down there and left my briefing on, on the, on, up here. And I thought, how can I sort of interrupt you to, or you to get there? But I thought I won't do it. So there we are. So what we have is um, we're going to have a, a video. And it's, it's about, hang on, let me just look at, read this. Uh, one second. Yep. It's about the disability movement, and it's from the president of the Africa Disability Forum. And it's going to give us a glimpse as to what some of the issues are, where you have a mixture of resilience, the impact of funding or non-funding, but what can happen uh, uh, around these issues. So we have, um, the, uh, let me just say, Idris Azumba Maiga with the video. Idris Maiga, je suis président du Forum Africain des Personnes Handicapées. Je suis âgé de 50 ans et j'ai eu la polio à l'âge de 2 ans. Et je suis une personne handicapée physique en fauteuil roulant. J'ai commencé à militer dans le mouvement des personnes handicapées dans les années 2000. Et j'ai été respectivement président de la Fédération nigérienne des personnes handicapées de 2009 à 2017, président de la Fédération ouest-africaine des associations de personnes handicapées au pouvoir ou à fond en anglais de 2012 à 2019 et président du Forum africain des personnes handicapées de 2019, octobre 2019 à ce jour. Et je suis euh, inspecteur principal des impôts. Donc euh, ma carrière dans le mouvement, c'était vraiment suite à la demande des personnes handicapées d'être intégrées et d'avoir un travail décent. Et étant jeune diplômé, nous avons mené le combat pour que les droits des personnes handicapées soient mis en œuvre, notamment par rapport à, à, à l'emploi. Et j'ai été président de ce comité qui m'a fait connaître du grand public. Et depuis lors, je n'ai jamais reculé par rapport à la lutte pour le droit des personnes handicapées. Donc je suis, comme je l'ai dit, j'ai été d'abord vice-président du Forum africain à sa création. En 2015, le, la première assemblée sera la constitutive. Et de 2015 à 2019, j'étais vice-président. Et de 2019 à ce jour, je suis président du Forum africain des personnes handicapées. Le Forum africain des personnes handicapées est le regroupement de toutes les organisations de personnes handicapées d'Afrique. Et il a deux objectifs principaux. Euh, unifier et amplifier la voix des personnes handicapées et leurs familles et les organisations en Afrique au niveau national, régional et international. Et le deuxième objectif, c'est de renforcer les capacités des organisations des personnes handicapées en Afrique euh, afin de pouvoir promouvoir les droits à et l'inclusion des personnes handicapées et leurs familles. De plus, le Forum africain <coughs> euh, a pour objectif secondaire de promouvoir la sensibilisation des droits aux droits des personnes handicapées et à l'inclusion du handicap parmi les personnes handicapées et leurs familles, les OPAS, les ONG de développement, les organisations confessionnelles, les gouvernements, les prestataires de services. Deuxième objectif, est de, en, en, comme objectif secondaire, en deuxième position, nous avons le renforcement des capacités des fédérations continentale, sous-régionale et nationale, à promouvoir elle-même les droits des personnes handicapées, à autonomiser les personnes handicapées, leurs familles et renforcer les réseaux, les réseaux en partenariat, de, de, en, en partenariat régional. Et représenter les personnes handicapées d'Afrique et représenter la voix, leur voix partout, et la, la, ainsi que la voix de leurs familles auprès de l'Union africaine, auprès des communautés économiques régionales et d'autres organisations africaines et internationales, ainsi que lors des réunions régionales et, et, et internationales. En plus du, de son travail de plaidoyer, le Forum africain travaille pour euh, la 
sur la protection sociale pour les personnes handicapées, l'accès aux soins de santé, l'éducation inclusive, les dispositifs d'assistance, le développement des petites entreprises pour les personnes handicapées, l'emploi et la sécurité sociale, tel que les transferts monétaires aux personnes handicapées, la sécurité alimentaire et le renforcement des capacités de nos membres régionaux et nationaux. Et le Forum africain, à travers ses membres, a mis en œuvre, a réalisé des activités et, telles que des forats sur différentes thématiques, un forum sur la santé, un forum sur l'éducation inclusive, un forum sur la santé, un forum sur l'accessibilité, un forum pour l'accès et l'emploi des personnes handicapées et un forum sur euh, handicap et urgence humanitaire. Le plus grand problème auquel sont confrontées les personnes handicapées en Afrique, c'est l'extrême pauvreté. Aux conditions d'extrême pauvreté s'ajoute la discrimination auxquelles sont confrontées les personnes handicapées, fondées sur les stéréotypes négatifs. La méconnaissance des droits humains des personnes handicapées, les inégalités structurelles fondées sur les obstacles qui empêchent aux personnes handicapées d'accéder à l'éducation, aux soins de santé, à l'emploi et à la microfinance. Le gouvernement africain manque de fonds pour fournir ces transferts monétaires aux personnes handicapées ou pour permettre de mettre en œuvre les obligations ils ont librement, auxquelles ils ont librement souscrit à travers la ratification de la Convention relative aux droits des personnes handicapées. Voilà les problèmes auxquels les personnes handicapées en Afrique sont pour la plus grande part confrontées. Et je voudrais de dire ma petite histoire par rapport au mouvement. Et je suis un jeune diplômé en fiscalité et domaine. Je suis inspecteur principal des impôts et mon combat a commencé lorsque j'ai fini la formation en 2002 et qu'il manquait d'emploi pour les personnes handicapées. Donc j'ai commencé à militer dans le mouvement pour que ces thématiques soient assez discutées, assez portées auprès du gouvernement. Et le combat véritablement pour l'emploi des personnes handicapées au Niger s'est passé en 2006 où nous avons lutté et obtenu l'intégration à la fonction publique de 150 jeunes diplômés. Donc pour nous, ça a été le déclic, le déclenchement de notre combat à faire changer les choses en ce qui concerne la vie des personnes handicapées, notamment la prise en compte de leurs besoins dans tous les programmes, plans et politiques de développement conformément à la Convention relative aux droits des personnes handicapées et à l'agenda 2030. Notre fédération au Niger est le principal interlocuteur du gouvernement et des partenaires. Et nous avons pu obtenir et à faire adopter beaucoup de textes de loi de promotion des droits des personnes handicapées. Et notre combat est qu'aujourd'hui en Afrique, les fédérations soient les seuls interlocuteurs des gouvernements et des partenaires. Donc l'ADF, le Forum africain des personnes handicapées, travaille en partenariat avec, des, travaille avec des partenaires européens sur des activités que nous avons décrites ci-dessus. L'un des principaux défis que le gouvernement et les acteurs européens décident, sans nous consulter des priorités qu'ils vont financer. Cela signifie que nous sommes censés être aidés. Nous ne sommes pas consultés. Nous n'avons pas de voix en Europe. Et si nous pouvons que compter sur des ONG d'Europe pour s'associer à nous, nous apprécions ce partenariat. Mais nous aimerions davantage être consultés de manière significative. Nous souhaitons aussi que notre capacité soit développée afin que nous puissions mettre en œuvre nos propres activités sans que l'Europe envoie des experts nous faire le travail que nous pouvons faire. Nous aimerions davantage de délocalisation des dépenses du développement. Nous aimerions également accéder directement aux, 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 aux bailleurs, aux donateurs. À l'heure actuelle, le processus d'obtention du financement est si difficile que seuls les experts dans ce domaine de la collecte des fonds peuvent accéder aux donateurs européens. Nous aimerions que les donateurs européens se concentrent davantage sur le renforcement des capacités des organisations de la société civile africaine, en particulier les organisations de personnes handicapées. L'Europe économisera beaucoup d'argent si elle finance directement les organisations africaines. Et pour cela, je m'en vais formuler des recommandations 
qui sont les suivants. Soutenir directement les organisations africaines, renforcer les capacités des organisations africaines, soutenir les mesures de lutte contre la pauvreté, inclure les personnes handicapées dans les secours en cas de catastrophe et se concentrer sur l'inclusion lorsque les fonds européens sont utilisés pour le climat et les secours liés aux catastrophes. Faciliter le processus de demande de financement européen ou bilatéral pour les organisations africaines. Parce que vous n'êtes pas sans savoir que l'Union européenne finance beaucoup de secteurs de nos pays, mais ils ne sont pas portés et apportés directement aux organisations de personnes handicapées. Et nous souhaiterons que cela soit une réalité, que nous collaborions avec les organisations et des personnes handicapées européennes et pour que la main dans la main, nous puissions amener les fire de fois les donateurs européens à s'engager directement avec nos organisations et les financer directement. Je vous remercie. What a brilliant contribution. What a brilliant set of messages. Um, nothing that we haven't heard before, actually, if you think about it. Uh, again, as I was saying, that narrative of uh, lack of direct consultation, not being involved in setting priorities, working through intermediaries. It's ever thus in Africa, actually, in the sense that you never get to the heart of the issue or the problem of a community. And at some points, we need to be able to change that dynamic. And as, as Idris says in that, that actually, until we um, change that mindset, and that go back to my opening point, of how, do, how does policy, what are the public policy objectives of aid and development and anti-poverty measures? And what we have here, I think one of the things, that this is not just in Africa, but in, across the world, that the issue of disability in various communities, it can be um, uh, something which is ignored, uh, seen as being uh, an absolute failure of a family or a community, um, and actually not acknowledged. And in many parts of Africa, India, Latin America, it's the same, and in, in, in Asia uh, more broadly. And I think that you, when you think about how people with the lack of ability, or people we call disability, the quality of their treatment says a lot about the quality of our society. And I think we must just remember that deeply and sharply as we think about what we're doing here today and in our priority setting. Um, we now have a, um, a, we're going to have a presentation from Blandine. Where are you? There you are. So you're a, a board member of Concord and been looking at this agenda. And what you're going to receive now is a set of reflections and messages from within Concord as to what should be the issues. And it really is, the question is, um, is it a gateway or is it a dead end? And so to answer that question, Landine, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello. Hello, everybody. Oh, should be careful. <laughs> um, so I'm Blandine Bougnol. I'm um, a board member of Concord, indeed, and in my daily life, the deputy director of uh, advocacy at uh, Humanity and Inclusion, a member organization of Concord. So I am not going to be the one who actually is going to give all the answers to that. I'm going to invite a number of uh, friends and colleagues uh, to do it. But first and foremost, we wanted to uh, invite you to interact a little bit uh, directly on the issue of inequalities. And we have a Mentimeter for you. So uh, if you can get out your um, mobile phones, which I'm sure you all have uh, one. And if you are not yet connected to the Wi-Fi, uh, the password, uh, first you have to go to the network uh, with the NH Hotel Conference. And then you have a password, which is conference with a capital C at Berlaymont with a capital B. Only the Brussels friends will know how to spell Berlaymont, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think someone is going to put it on the screen, right? Here you go. Okay, that's the password. Give me a sign if you are all connected. I know it's been... Uh, bit of a struggle for me at least. Okay, connected. Everyone, yes, bit thumb up, not yet. Still working on it. Connected, yes, more or less. Uh, then you'll have to log in the Mentimeter, right? If we can put this on the screen. Yeah. 
So you go to menti.org, yes, you have the QR code you can scan or you use this um, code. And you shout when you're ready. Have can make a, a choir there of little <laughs> Yes, are you all logged in? No. Struggling? Uh. Can you see just if some people have managed? <laughs> so, thank you. It's <laughs> <That's> reassuring. <laughs> Yeah, ladies, yeah, fine, more or less. Okay, <laughs> let's start. So yes, well, some of you have already input it. Uh, we wanted to ask you what uh, words um, would you associate um, with the term inequalities and to see what comes out of that. Injustice is coming first. Poverty, green growth is a myth. <laughs> Access, I see education, disadvantage, women and girls, power imbalances, hyperglobalization, I'm reading multidimension, unfairness, marginalization, colonial, fight, challenges, of course, diseases gender discrimination, power hierarchies. Well, you are certainly inspired. You can keep going. <laughs> there are so many, so many, so many aspects, so many dimensions of, uh, of inequalities. And that's why we are here together. Ageism, patriarchy, people. I will, I will finish on these people because that's what brings us together. So, um, the next question to you will be um, a little bit more complicated now. How much are the poorest countries spending on repaying debts in relation to healthcare budgets? So, is it two times more that they are spending on repaying debt rather than on healthcare? Is it about the same? Is it four times more? Or do you think they spend slightly more on healthcare than on replay, repaying debts? How do you see this? Four times more. Well, you have the correct answers. Yeah, that's four times more. Let's move on to the next um, question. According to you, those who have read Eight Watch report, you have no choice but to get it right. So, how many least developed countries are among the top 10 recipients of EU's aid? Is it 10, 0, 5, or 3? How many of the least developed countries? Sorry? <laughs> you, thought, you thought it was two? <laughs> now, this option is not available, Tanya. <laughs> One and a half either. <laughs> So that's three indeed. Only three least developed countries are amongst the top 10 recipients of EU aid. And just another question for you, which is uh, giving us a bit the, the spirit of the moment. Is it true or not that EU member states have declared that lacking, tackling inequality sorry, is an internal and external priority for the EU? Yes, it's true. It's from the EU Council conclusions in 2019. Well done, I think you, you got it right for most of it and thank you for your inspiring share of um, terms in the beginning. 
So that was to, to set a bit of the scene and we will continue doing this anyway throughout the day. Uh, as Talia was saying earlier, anyway, uh, uh, inequality, as you know, has been part of uh, Concord agenda and has been part of the discussions in Concord for a very long time. Um, in it's, it's not only today, you know, we have for those who are from the house, um, uh, it's not something that is just dealt in one uh, specific uh, working group, it's actually something that is worked on across uh, the different uh, uh, working groups of, Co of Concord, and that's why it, was, it wouldn't have been fair that I would be the one presenting everything that Concord has been doing and the key messages that we wanted to deliver to you about uh, what Concord think and how Concord approach inequalities. Uh, so that's why I was, I'm going to invite a number of um, friends and colleagues involved in different working groups who are going to give you um, the insights from uh, their sector's perspectives uh, on, uh, the, on, on, on the positions of, of Concord on how we should be best addressing and first of all, first of, uh, all analyzing uh, inequalities as part of, uh, of our work. Um, we were going to organize this, um, uh, this input that the colleagues are going to share according to this, um, it's not very practical to be ecological friendly and uh, print uh, <laughs> Hector Verso when I need to turn around my paper. Anyway, so we are going to organize these inputs uh, according to the key findings, five uh, key findings that we uh, uh, had in this um, uh, recently, I mean actually today, launched uh, publication on inequalities and I will remember, remind you, sorry, those key findings. So one was the need to recognize inequalities as structural uh, in all the dimensions in intersecting routes. Uh, the other one is the importance of a coherent approach across policy sectors and of course the need to invest in long-term sustainable uh, and systemic changes. Uh, the essential role of dialogue and partnerships uh, requiring the systemic, uh, systematic sorry, engagement with communities and of course the need to defend human rights and putting people at the center of policies. So from again their own perspective colleagues will explain uh, more of this and I'm going to start with giving the mic uh, to uh, Chiara Putaturo, who is the uh, EU Inequalities and Tax Policy Advisors at Oxfam EU office. So Chiara is here. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, so it has been already said, I think uh, everybody agrees here that inequalities, so not just inequality, is, um, are a key challenges of our time. They are structural, and they, are, uh, they have roots uh, in the economic, patriarchal, and neocolonial systems. What we want in Concord uh, is that uh, the European Union and member states not just recognize inequality in their systemic structural nature, but also walk the talk and uh, develop and implement tools to integrate the fight against uh, inequality in uh, programs and, uh, and projects. And in doing so, um, they need to adopt a multidimensional multi approach, as it has been said, and an intersectional approach. Multidimensional means uh, to look at the different aspects, dimension of inequality, not just economic, but also social, also those related uh, to, uh, to disability, to, uh, to the political participation, to climate change. And then uh, intersectionality, um, that, that means uh, looking at how different kind of inequalities interact with each other and re reinforce each other. We heard from uh, uh, the, the, previous, uh, the previous speaker how disability interacts with, uh, with poverty. So inequalities are, are complex and uh, this complexity needs to be, to be addressed in order to, not, uh, leave, to leave no one behind. Um, in the last year's Concord has conducted some analysis uh, to, to look um, how uh, inequality is embedded in the uh, international cooperation and there, there are still some, uh, some gaps. Last year uh, we published uh, an analysis on uh, EU member states and uh, we saw that uh, despite the fact that um, inequality is, is recognized in, um, uh, in the international cooperation policies of um, all member states, only few of them have tools to mainstream uh, inequality. 
there are few analyses, uh, uh, there is a lack of impact assessment uh, on inequality, a lack of dedicated staff uh, and of um, uh, trainings uh, to, for, for officials on, on inequality. And what about the European Union? We conducted uh, um, an analysis on the documents uh, of the European policies that have an external dimension. This was uh, two years ago. Like, for example, the international dimension of the European Green Deal or the global response to COVID. And we found out that even if the problem of inequality is increasingly uh, covered and prioritized, there were still some policy, like the EU Africa strategy where inequality was not considered. And many documents were not approaching inequality with uh, a multidimensional, intersectional approach, um, dimensions, and there were not uh, targeted solutions. So uh, we have the opportunity today, we will have in the next panel the opportunity to hear more about uh, what, what else the Commission has done also in these last years. Uh, and uh, yeah, I hope that there will be improvements on these uh, on these sides. And I will pass to the next speaker, right? I, I will introduce. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. So yes, indeed, we heard from, um, from Chiara that inequalities have multiple dimensions and many faces and uh, many negative consequences. And we as Europeans have different responsibilities and different roles to play if we're serious about leaving no one behind. One is about mobilizing uh, the actors, the resources, the tools of international cooperation. But as Europeans, we should also, of course, look at ourselves in the mirror and take all uh, responsibilities and possible steps to avoid creating or exacerbating uh, inequalities by avoiding the negative consequences of decisions we take uh, in different policy sectors. That is called policy coherence for development. And I'm giving the floor to uh, Kees Knust, who is the political advisor at Word and Dad in the Netherlands, explaining um, a little bit more about this to us. Well, thank you, uh, Blandine also for pronouncing my name uh, correctly. <laughs> you practiced uh, very well. Uh, well, without policy coherence for uh, sustainable development, it will be hard, if not impossible, to deliver on Agenda 2030. PCSD might even be more important than uh, development cooperation as such. Why? Because we see that our policies and practices, or at least some of them, in one area are counteracting our efforts in international cooperation and negatively impact partner countries. For example, and these examples come for, from our uh, today published inequalities report, uh, our demand for soy is aggravating the expulsion of the indigenous people from their lands in Paraguay, which is actually happening. And the EU's quest for natural resources to realize our green transition may harm ecosystems and communities in, let's say, Congo. PCSD can play a role, a big role, in tackling these negative trade-offs. But then the full commitment of the EU is needed. We have commitment on paper. Policy coherence for development is a treaty obligation and PCSD is part of Agenda 2030. We have several mechanisms and tools in place in the EU to ensure policy coherence. Yet to put words into practice remains a challenge. Concord's evidence shows there's room for improvement. As we are at the halfway point towards 2030, the Commission should firstly develop a sustainable Europe 2030 strategy and an overarching implementation plan to reach the SDGs. Secondly, the Commission president should take leadership and overall responsibility for PCSD. Thirdly, the EU should, should systematically conduct impact assessments, both ex ante and ex post, that fully integrate the SDGs and take into account impacts of EU policies on the Global South. And lastly, these impact assessments should be based on meaningful consultation of civil society and stakeholders, both in Europe and in partner countries. PCSD is not an option, but a must if we want to tackle inequalities. Thank you. Thank you, Case. 
So we just heard from you that um, a determined and coherent approach, of course, uh, in all policy sectors is key to tackle inequalities. And now we're going to focus on the specific um, uh, policy sector and programs in relation to international cooperation. And we'll hear about the key ingredients and the approaches that could generate uh, significant changes. And it's uh, Borja Arue, uh, our senior political and uh, advocacy advisor at Concord Secretariat is going to tell us more. Thank you, Blandine. Very well pronounced as well. It's not an easy one. Um, so indeed, for Concord, it is essential that projects and programs uh, try to generate and do their best and are ambitious about generating long-term change, sustainable change. Because we heard this morning how inequalities is a structural phenomenon. We need projects and programs to be very ambitious in training changes in communities and making them last for long. And for that, of course, um, local ownership and addressing the political, the economic, uh, and the social realities of communities is absolutely essential. In the case studies on inequalities, uh, we found some inspiring examples that point in the direction of generating sustainable results and impacts. In the case of Paraguay, for example, we uh, talked to people involved in Bridging the Gap, which was a project funded by the EU uh, and which was aiming to improve the policies for people with disabilities. And uh, the fact that uh, people with disabilities themselves really were involved in the design of the project, in the implementation of the project, it allowed the project to produce some outputs that we know have been generating some concrete impacts in the ability of Paraguayan policymakers to address the realities and the needs of persons with disabilities in public policy. In Bangladesh, for example, we saw how a project called Action for Impact supported young people to get together around hubs where they could become more aware of their common needs and also train themselves on advocacy in order to talk to politicians and change the reality of their communities. And in South Africa, for example, we saw how uh, ACIVIC Elane, a project funded by the EU, uh, was supporting residents in informal settlements uh, to share data about their livelihoods, about their challenges, and how this data was then uh, shared with policymakers. Uh, there were community organizers uh, providing uh, training on advocacy to residents and how you know, all this data served the purpose of influencing public, public policy. And we already saw also some changes in terms of budgets allocated to supporting the residents in informal settlements in Johannesburg. So all in all, generating long-term change is not easy, uh, but a clear condition, key condition for it is uh, to uh, talk to communities and to engage with communities and to embed projects in their economic, social and political realities. Thank you. Thank you, Borja. So you just uh, tell us how important it is to embed um, uh, EU programs and projects into the uh, reality of the people that we are aimed to assist and serve. And uh, there is nothing that can be done without the direct and systematic engagement of the communities themselves. And this is what we're going to hear from other colleagues about civil society participation and community engagement. So I'll give the first, uh, first the microphone to Karin Soe, who is Senior Policy uh, Officer at ACT Alliance and she will uh, give it then to uh, Eva, uh, Lunes, uh, Eva, <laughs> Eva Luna Mas uh, from uh, the Concord Secretariat. Thank you. Thank you, Blandine. Uh, yeah, so my name is Karin Soe, not Karin Schut, <laughs> as it's written down. Um, <laughs> although I hope I make a shoot. <laughs> Um, so indeed, so by now we, are, we all agree that people's participation in public life and in policy making is essential if we want lasting change uh, towards equality. EU cannot rely only on its dialogue with partner governments if it really wants to go beyond aid and to build partnerships of equals. And uh, people's realities, concerns, ideas must be taken on board. The Joint Africa EU Civil Society Declaration for the Africa EU Summit of last year says, civil society participation is crucial to ensure that cooperation between the EU and EU promotes joint priorities, that flagship initiatives resonate with local realities and possible existing solutions, and that no one is left behind. 
So this was a clear message from African and European civil society together. The EU must support meaningful spaces for civil society engagement in its international partnerships. And Concord published a seven practice paper, I invite you to read it, where we say what we mean by meaningful. It means structured and ongoing dialogue mechanism. It means co-creation of agendas, methodologies and content with civil society. It means quality information, accessibility, inclusion and safety for all participants, transparency and accountability. And very important, it also means civil society autonomy to self-organize. It requires a cultural shift at EC, EAS and delegations level, but also, of course, at partner governments level and maybe inside civil society as well. A promising process in which Concord plays a leading role, co-leading role, not alone, <laughs> with other EU and African civil society, is the civil society proposal for a meaningful civil society mechanism inside the official EU-EU partnership. And to support that, a self-organized civil society platform for engagement. The aim of the platform is to ensure equal access for all civil society from EU and Africa, in particular people's organizations, which is key when fight, fighting for <laughs> equality. Too many people are excluded from public life and have no access to policy making today. And I hand over to Eva Luna, who will speak to that issue from, with a gender lens. Hello everyone, so uh, my name is Eva Luna Maas and I am a policy and advocacy advisor at Concord and indeed um, I wanted to talk to you about the fact that women's equal participation in all aspects of society is essential in achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. Um, local women's rights organizations as well as the activism of feminist movements has been proven um, to make the biggest impact when it comes to achieving transform transformational change for gender equality and pushing forward the women's rights organizations in partner countries, as well as reducing inequalities in general. This is because local women's rights organizations are actually in a unique position to understand the local realities of um, women in, in local communities and they have a greater outreach um, towards structurally excluded people in all their diversity through both um, their service delivery as well as um, their ongoing advocacy efforts. So Concord thinks thinks that there are two main ways that the EU can support these organizations. So first of all, um, as we heard um, the commissioner this morning, um, the EU has made many commitments to um, including local women's rights organizations and feminist movements in both um, policy making and decision making processes. And, but we think that the EU can do more both at headquarters level as well as at country level, because we see that, um, for example, the outreach of EU delegations is still mostly towards the usual suspects. So often um, it's only organizations represented in the capital of countries um, that are able to participate in um, consultations, for example. So we want the EU to and, and EU delegations to um, try harder to reach out to um, also organizations working at the intersection of gender and other sources of inequality, such as disability, um, uh, religion, age, or sexual preference. A second point where the EU could do more is funding access for these types of organizations. Um, even though, again, um, there, as we heard the commissioner this morning, the commitment is there in terms of actions um, that have gender equality as a main objective. But in reality, OECD data from last year shows that um, only 0.5% of the um, EU's official development assistance with gender equality as a focus goes directly towards these types of organizations, which is a real issue. Um, so from Concord, from all of us, we, um, we call on the EU 
to increase the direct, long-term, flexible and core funding to, um, the, to local women's rights organizations, feminist movements, as well as other civil society organizations in partner countries that push forward this agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Karine and, and Salome. And now, uh, sorry, and Eva Luna, <laughs> I have an issue. Um, I'm actually giving now the floor to Salome, who's going to tell us more about how uh, we can be putting people uh, first at the center of uh, policies and programs and uh, with the overall objective to defend human rights. Yes, uh, thank you, Blondine. So the last point that we would like to share with you today is about human rights. The case studies that we research clearly demonstrate the importance of supporting the agency of people to defend their own human rights wherever they are, but also our partners, civil society organizations uh, in the different countries, shared that the very presence of the EU in their country can create an enabling environment for dialogue on human rights and can um, encourage and provide a boost to the human rights agenda. So there is a clear demand uh, from civil society around the world and people for the EU to continue to protect um, human rights around the world. Now, all the different elements that have been shared by my colleagues and that Blondine uh, summarized at the beginning are part of what Concord considers to be a people-centered approach. And this is an approach that when we apply it in our policies and in practice through projects and programs, can ensure that we put the needs of those most marginalized structurally in our societies first, um, and then that we can support the realization of all their human rights, social, political, economical, and environmental rights, uh, and ultimately further uh, equality. And the last thought that I would like to share is that we consider this to be relevant in the context of the EU's geopolitical ambitions, in particular because of the EU's stated intention to promote a value-based and human rights-based model um, so we very much believe that inequalities must remain a priority and we hope that the different elements that were shared can be part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Salome. So this was to give you um, uh, a glimpse of uh, the messages that Concord is carrying uh, in relation to inequalities. And believe me, we had to make a choice <laughs> because the work of Concord on inequalities is very rich and very deep and you have a lot of publication and evidence that can help you even go further. I really invite you to have a look at all the different publications that these messages are um, embedded into. Um, we clearly got a sense of the urgency on the matter, but also, and that is uh, what Tanya was saying earlier, the tone of, of the day, uh, those constructive and uh, existing solutions that exist out there uh, that could be activated to make significant changes. So I wish you all a good rest of the day. I think I can call on the break. It's a break. <laughs>